Hello everyone, welcome to the Service on Pilots podcast and today we have another special episode. Today with my guest Tom, we're going to talk about the future of coding, the future of application and the ServiceNow app engine itself. So hello, how are you today? Hi Marcel, hi. Thanks for having me here, it's good to be here. Yeah, it's great. If you could just uh, quickly introduce yourself to our pilots out there, it would be good before we jump into the the main topic um sure yeah uh, my name is tom tomas in polish <laughs> everybody calls me tom for short um i uh i work for the spark uh, company um in the capacity of um senior technical consultant and architect um i'm also strongly involved in the area of um low code um no code kind of synthesis citizen development app engine is the service is now solution for that, the service now platform that supports that kind of pretty new trend, I would say, in uh, in IT, in the in coding. Uh, I've been doing that for uh, about eight years now, been involved with the service now platform for the same amount of time. So I've seen a lot of changes, you know, within that time, how the platform evolved, how the market evolved, how the, you know, expectations of clients and uh, the end users, how those have changed over the years. It's uh, you know, it's amazing how how much those things have transformed. Part of that's been driven by events like the pandemic and everybody working for hop from home for sure. So we, we kind of see certain trends there. But yeah, it's uh, been a long journey so far and uh, no end in sight. So <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited that you're here and uh, uh, you're willing to share your knowledge and your experience with us. As you mentioned, eight years of experience, that's a long time. And, uh, yeah, I envy you that because you understand this environment more than, than me and uh, probably our, our viewers out there. So maybe let's focus for now. Let's start from the, from the beginning of, of coding of the application builds. Mm-hmm. Uh, how would you, how would you describe the traditional or the, or the just nowadays how it looks, the, the application right. build pro- building process? Yeah, I mean, uh, okay, that's uh, how how do you build an application, basically? Yeah, I mean, now it's a kind of a broad question, really, and it really depends what type of application it is, I guess. But uh, the, the the kind of approach that I see the most, uh, I suppose, uh, working on projects is, uh, you know, obviously, everybody prefers to work in agile methodology nowadays, um, meaning you've got that uh, continuous cycle of de- developing some new functionality, consulting that with the client, iterating over that, improving and so on and so on. And it's obviously, you know, the um I would say the 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 functionality working, working functionality is put above documentation definitely and above all of that, you know, mm-hmm. all of that BS that maybe prevents you from delivering value a little bit or just hinders you to some to some extent. Um, so yeah, agile is definitely, uh, something that we, we see a lot, uh, of course, bigger applications, bigger projects, they may still have a tendency to be done in a waterfall model where you have the, the milestones, you need to have a proper design of the whole solution up front. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I would say regardless of the methodology that you, that you, that you do, uh, you, you always need to have, um, uh, first of all, a clear understanding of the requirements. So there needs to be somebody who can gather the requirements from the business. Uh, typically, that's um, um, a business analyst or uh, a, a business consultant type of a person that goes to the client, gathers the requirements, creates a backlog, creates a stories. Uh, within that, uh, then you need somebody who understands how to translate that output from the client into the specific platform that you're working with can be AWS, can be Azure, can be service now. So you need an architect typically to uh, pretty much have an overall vision of that solution and, you know, uh, what kind of APIs, what kind of components of those platforms you will utilize for a project. And then typically developers get involved and, you know, the, uh, the epics are transformed into lower level stories. So quite often we work with the user story. Uh, it kind of depends on the on the way the, the, the companies prefer to work with those, but um, stories need to be pretty precise because you need to be able to measure if that story has been completed successfully or not. So we have this term definition of done. So what does it mean that we've done, we've completed that story? You know, can it be approved and uh, accepted by the client and so on? So that, that needs to be 
quite measurable and so on. And, you know, that's a pretty, you know, overall, I would say, even though uh, Agile is supposed to make things uh, easy and smooth, uh, that can be a pretty tedious and a long process, especially because there is a, there's a big gap between developers working on an application and the business. It goes via the consultants, it goes via the architects, of course. Modern teams try to involve developers in those meetings as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, quite often, the reality is that, you know, uh, there's always some translation. And there, sometimes there can be things which are lost in translations between the business and the developers. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, the the typical way of building applications for your business looks like there's a lot of miscommunication or might be a lot of miscommunication due to siloed, uh, due to the processes is very siloed. There is sometimes a potential for that, yeah. And I, I think I especially saw that working on larger projects, um, not only involving service now, but I've, I've seen projects, for example, implementations of other big platforms like SAP. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, those, those you know, implementations tend to have large teams and quite often you can see some specific uh sort of departmentalization in those teams or creating those silos, as you mentioned, that there is one team handling, like, uh, let's say, API, uh, communication integration part. There will be another team that works on the business process, for example, ITSM process part, like working on handling incidents or tickets. Another team may be working on finance. And, uh, yeah, that sometimes uh, is very prone to certain miscommunication and things being lost in the translation because, obviously, the the more people you have involved who, who need to pass information onwards to, to other teams, uh, the more likely it is that something will go wrong. And uh, that's also why nowadays a lot of teams prefer to uh, or try to get rid of this silo approach as much as possible and mm-hmm. just work, try to have a, maybe mixed teams, you know, uh, or um, have the developers be closer to the business, actually, to yeah. avoid that type of situation. And do you see any other disadvantages of this, let's say, traditional way of uh, building applications? Um, well, what we definitely, what we, I guess, what 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 we see a lot is um, um, traditional approach. Well, it, it kind of depends what methodology you you assume, and also in what technology you deliver this. Uh, there is definitely a lot of legacy. Um, you know, legacy applications, legacy implementations out there, which kind of illustrates the way things have been happening mm-hmm. until recently, for sure. Uh, people were kind of choosing the technology, almost you could say at random. Well, def- definitely there were some factors involved in, in, in choosing that technology. But uh, talking to, to clients, we see a lot of processes being handled using legacy applications, completely different technologies, you know, that has to be supported. I think nowadays there is more trend to gravitate towards, first of all, cloud, of course. That's why we are here. That's why we are having this discussion. The uh, cloud is, is becoming the, the dominant strategy for, um, I think, uh, for implementing major company enterprise processes. And that also allows to streamline the technology much better. So now, now everybody focuses kind of on the, the biggest players, AWS, you know, um, Azure, Google, uh, service now for that, for that, um, uh, ITSM and other workflow driven processes. Um, so I would say the, um, the traditional approach, um, is changing as well and is migrating towards those kind of predefined components. So it's getting better, but still in terms of traditional development, it takes time. It takes a lot of time and effort. It's a costly process. And there is there is one more very critical problem, I would say, on the market right now: the lack of professional resources. Mm-hmm. And you know, uh, in the past, it was uh, even more evident because there were a lot of different technologies used. Today, it's kind of I, I think it's 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 starting to centralize more, but still, there is simply lack of um, developers, lack of uh, skilled uh, technical consultants. Uh, there is more uh, demand then there is, you know, the capacity to cover it. Um, so that is a big problem for a lot of companies. They have uh, huge demands from their users, from from the markets to transform, you know, to update their processes. But they just yeah. cannot get the, 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 work for, the workforce from the market to do that. You know? Yeah, especially in, in a time. 
especially in time when the technology itself uh, can provide you with many capabilities and it can it, there are many products within the service now platform and service now itself encourages you to use your platform to the fullest but as you mentioned the IT world or IT specialist world is very small the service now world is even smaller so you have to find those capabilities or you you have to find uh, uh, the people who work on it within your I think SEB is now, and it's easy for me to talk about SEB is now because of the you know, experience I have. So in SEB is now, that's absolutely like you said, it's very evident that there is a lack of skilled workforce and SEB is now themselves, they have a program, they have a, a goal of enabling up to a million people in a, in a short time. I think they want to achieve that by next year. Don't quote me on that, by the way, I, I don't remember exactly, but in, they have a big mission to empower as much people to be able to use the platform and, and deliver wonderful content, you know, on the platform as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, because they also see that 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 problem that their clients have at the moment, you know, and that is pretty much also why we are here today yeah. discussing the the alternative approach that 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 has emerged in the last few years, let's say, and that is the the kind of local or sometimes as people call it citizen development mm -hmm. kind of trend. Yeah, I would like to uh, ask you about the citizen development in the further uh, part of our conversation. Let's now maybe focus on the how the low code or no code approach uh, can solve the the problems we mentioned before uh, using the traditional uh, development. Uh, because uh, a service now is going to uh, train more and more people, you will have more and more people skilled within the service now platform from yeah. the technical part. Uh, their skills need to be yeah. managed and needs to be used on the daily basis. So absolutely, uh, how can they do that? Yeah, and those people that I mentioned, they will not all be developers. They will not all be like 100% IT professionals. Yeah. Big majority of them is just kind of crossing over from different areas. There's a lot of people who were uh, business stakeholders, but they kind of, they, they want to be involved more in the creation part for their processes, for their departments, you know, so they they migrate over to kind of becoming those, uh, let's call them low-code implementers. I personally, maybe, I'm not in uh, I, I, I don't like this term, citizen development too much. Let's discuss it later yeah. a little bit. But again, I prefer to call those people, I don't know, implementers or uh -huh. uh, something along those lines. Um, so yeah, there, there will be more, peop more people like that who are not necessarily trained IT professionals, but they want to deliver content, you know. And first of all, today it's easier to do that because platforms like Service now they give you tools, they give you capabilities to be able to achieve your end-to-end -end processes and implement 90% maybe of the things you need. Um leveraging a, a low-code approach where you don't necessarily have to know how to write code, how mm -hmm. to use the different APIs to achieve um, the, the desired effect. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, just coming back to your question, um, I think there's huge potential in that and, and everything is gravitating uh, towards low-code uh, because it allows to... Uh, Kind of shift the the focus uh, and the the need of resources from the very small, very skilled IT professional, you know, uh, a bunch of people mm -hmm. to a, a much wider audience, to much wider pool of stakeholders who can be involved and maybe even should be involved in developing those processes because they are closer to the business or they even represent the business. Okay. And of course, by saying that, I'm I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to say that, uh, you know, developers will be completely forgotten about, like the, the traditional developers. And absolutely, I don't think that's the way it will go. So the, the developers will still have their jobs, but they will just be able to focus on the more uh, more complex things in which also for them are probably the better usage of their skills yeah, and, and times. And a lot of business, um, a lot of business, you know, um, requirements can be solved uh, using low-code uh, platforms and using uh, this new um, approach, uh, having um, more business ready that people um, develop them using low-code. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because uh, many people out there are working on Excel files out there and uh, those Excel files may be called their applications that... Uh, and if I understand you, if I understand you correctly, for so for example, if I'm working on an Excel spreadsheet for last 
10 years or something yeah. and I would like to have it in my system. Nowadays, I should create a ticket that somewhere from the IT or IT service management uh, department would create that up for me. But if if my company uh, made me uh, do some courses to educate myself uh, from the service now platform, I could shorten the, t- the process of creation by implementing it myself. So I- and I imagine you, you, you probably already have a whole lot of great ideas how you could improve your own workflow, you know, th- things you are doing or that your department is doing at our company. So if you had the right tools and the right training to, to be able to, to change the status quo, you know, and, uh, and uh, introduce some more automated approach, maybe get rid of the boring tasks that you have to do, you know, have the technology do it for you. That would be for the benefit of everybody. So, yeah. And, and you mentioned Excel and Outlook. That's like a, a typical example, like the typical combo that we see, for, you know, when we approach a lot of companies. Uh, yeah. There was this one time when I was delivering uh, a set of pretty complex processes for one one large company. And what I did is I went on site and I, I looked at how they handle their, uh, their daily processes. So obviously Excel, Excel was everywhere. It was used for everything, keeping track of what we need to do, where we are, you know, uh, lists of tickets to be handled, uh, statuses and so on. Everything Excel and Outlook, obviously that was the, the single means of communication. Outlook, Outlook and, and a phone, phone mm-hmm. modes, obviously. Um, and, and what I even saw was people uh, carrying like uh, physical notepads around and they were just scribbling, you know, something in notepads. And, uh, and, and, you know, I come over and I ask them, like, what are you doing? Why are you writing something down? And they said, I'm writing the kind of deadline by which I need to consult some, something with the, okay. with this and this person. Otherwise, I would just forget. So that kind of shows how critical is the the need for proper tools for those companies to be able to to be able to to handle their process effectively, and you know if they if they all had to rely on traditional approach on pro code applications being built and on on having the right workforce, it could just take too long. You know, and the market is changing rapidly, and they need to have those processes now. They need to be able to transform now. They cannot wait two three years until um, you know uh, the the right set of people becomes available, and uh, it, it's also. Maybe even not not necess- necessary to do it that way today, because, like I said, pretty much a lot of those objectives can be achieved just utilizing low code. So again, there's there's like two typical two typical uh, situations I observe when talking to companies in the context of l- maybe introducing low code approach. Either there is no process automation, no tools to support the process, like you said, they're mm-hmm. just basically using Excel, Outlook, and some manual. Yeah. Oats. Or maybe they have some tools, but they are uh, built in legacy technologies. You know, things ranging from Lotus Notes to some um, third-party applications, homegrown applications, uh, and that, that uses a lot of different technologies, you know, Java, uh, C, um, uh, sometimes it's like a Python, sometimes it's Perl, different, completely different technologies, even different stacks of infrastructure on which those applications are hosted. And that generates a set of problems on its own, you know. So that's also a good candidate to sort of talk about streamlining this and maybe using a proper platform with the local. And what's the story behind uh, service now approach to to the topic of local? Because uh, yeah, you mentioned legacy tools, the uh, the tools that have been with us since I don't know the '90s probably, uh, and service now may looked at it, mm-hmm. saw the change, and yes. saw that it can be done better. And uh, how? ServiceNow and ServiceNow competitors actually are addressing the local approach to to the audience to to the today's world of the digital transformation. Yeah, yeah um, uh, all of the big companies are you know uh, actively participating in the local market for sure. Uh, I will just maybe use a ServiceNow as the example um, here. So ServiceNow started off as uh, mainly a tool that was recognized for its capabilities in the ITSM area were, you know, great workflows with which you could handle incident change management and so on. That was like many, many years ago. From then, ServiceNow has established themselves also as a leader in the low-code segment by offering, first of all, a great platform on which, you know, any kind of functionality can be developed. Mm-hmm. Not only 
uh, typical ITSM processes, but just basically any 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 process. It's it's a platform with a set of tools, a set of building blocks that you can utilize to achieve any business objective. Uh, hi, dear pilots. Unfortunately, we've uh, come across some technical issue. Those bloody cameras out there. I don't know what's happening, but uh, we're going to rewind a little bit, uh, take a step back. Maybe we, uh, during this uh, little break, we've cleared some thoughts. But uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to check the camera and uh, and and. Uh, and the question that uh, wasn't asked to the uh, wasn't being uh, answered to the fullest. So let's come back to the uh, mentioned by you legacy tools. Uh, so we've talked about uh, how the application process traditionally yeah. looks like right now. Then we uh, then we um, talked about the low code no code approach. Uh, also, we mentioned the Excel spreadsheets, the Outlooks, or even manual work uh, using uh, uh, just simply paper and, and pen. Uh, and those we called legacy tools. And now I'd like to ask you how ServiceNow, and of course other technologies than the ServiceNow, but let's focus on ServiceNow in this podcast, how it addresses the, not the problem, but the local mm-hmm. approach itself. Sure. Yeah, as uh, as we've already mentioned, that's a it's a global uh, kind of issue that needs to be addressed uh, because there is just a huge demand for new applications for a lot of small and simple applications, but they will still uh, improve the the way people work across all over the world from mm-hmm. all kind of industries. You know, uh, so there's a huge demand for that, and all the major players are pretty much investing in low code tools and low code capabilities. You know, so you've got, um, for example, Microsoft Power Apps that are um, quite popular, especially with the companies that have a uh, very strong connection to Microsoft and contractual, you know, kind of obligations. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking about Service Now, which is what I uh, deal with most, of course, um, Service Now has their own. Uh, capabilities and actually I think they are considered uh, the leader if one of the leaders or the leader in uh, low code segments so to say and I think the the uh, the, the, the key to that is the, the the ideology that they assume is not just about the technology but first and foremost it's about the process and the people you know uh, engaging people empowering the people to be able to start mm-hmm. utilizing the low code solution so when you think about service now, what we have is this app engine um, offering. Uh, it's let's say a dedicated product by Service Now that contains uh, a lot of building blocks um, uh, from which you can construct the applications. It contains its own low-code uh, IDE. You could say it, co- it contains uh, a local place to start creating your application. You can say, for example, I want to start my application by defining the workflow behind it, or I want to start with a front end. How should users interact with it? Or maybe I want to start with a table schema with the database and, you know, how everything's connected behind the scenes. So that gives you a lot of possibilities, but in the end, it's going to guide you through the process of creating your new application uh, without having you write, you know, specific code to achieve functionalities. Um, so that's one thing, the, the tool set that allows you to do that from technology perspective. But even more important, I think, is the approach towards governance of that because you need governance. Otherwise, uh, it will be chaos. People will just be creating whatever they want, of course, and that's not what we want. We want to understand which applications should be built. Uh, you know, every every application can affect the, the other applications and the entire ecosystem in a way. Maybe applications should interact with each other. Maybe they should exchange some data with each other and so on. So there needs to be a, a strong and robust intake process and a governance process and also development lifecycle process. And service now handles that as well. They um, they give you the app engine management console from which you can see all the requests for new applications coming from different departments, from different people. You can then decide uh, which application you want to move forward with. So one, you can prioritize certain apps over others. And then once you've made a decision to go ahead, uh, service now allows you to construct the specific team of low-code um, 
maybe not developers, low code implementers, <laughs> or even a mixture of a mix of low code and pro code professionals working on the same application because that's also seamlessly possible in service now. Uh, so you construct the team and you can allocate dedicated roles and capabilities for each person. So there could, there could be one person that deals with the workflows, another person maybe that handles the front end. Um, and by segregating those uh, duties and capabilities, you can also ensure that people uh, do not step out of you know their line and their kind of the area that they were assigned to. That allows you to mitigate potential issues. Um, so once you have that, you can then start the development process. And here again, service now provides you with a dedicated pipeline for those apps. So obviously, first the application can be prepared on the development instance. Uh, then it can be reviewed by somebody who is more technical. So typically, when a local application gets built, it should not just go into production. No, it needs to be reviewed by an architect or an admin type of person to double check if that application works according to, let's say, specification, but also, most importantly, that does it not affect anything else in a bad way? Uh, you mean the, the instance itself, that when you build several yeah. applications, they do not stumble each other or... Exactly. Or that, you know, yeah. Yeah. Has somebody modified a table that's maybe used by multiple applications in any way? That could, you know, there can be a lot of things that can affect other other places in the system. So that needs to be reviewed, of course. And depending on the scale and complexity of that application, that can be a very lightweight review or it can be a full-on technical review. You know, that, that, that kind of depends. Mm -hmm. So after the review, the application can get promoted through the pipeline to the uh, test environment. QA, uh, you can have automated tests running, of course. Service now provides those via the, the, the automated test framework mm -hmm. offering. And uh, after that is uh, done, it can be promoted to a uh, production finally and start being used. So that's the governance part and also the, the pipeline, the, the managing of this development process part. And then finally, we have people enablement. And maybe that's the most important aspect of this. So Service now uh, really, I think, does a good job in. Uh, first of all, uh, evangelizing, you know, the community mm -hmm. and, the, and their clients, the stakeholders about the capabilities of App Engine and the low-code kind of approach. And they also provide uh, a lot of trainings in this area that um, allow people who have not really been uh, involved in, in development of applications in any way, mm -hmm. uh, it allows them to start, you know, to uh, be able to create, develop, uh, and maybe develop, implement some applications for their departments. So all of those things kind of play together, uh, and uh, I think that's the, one of the biggest strengths that ServiceNow has, you know, uh, compared maybe even to other solutions that they, they, they really look holistically mm -hmm. uh, at this whole uh, local thing. Yeah, and, uh, and from your perspective, this very intrigues me, uh, because uh, you've been in this technology like uh, eight years, uh, and you and you must have been in some uh, amazing project and amazing application build. So if you could take that from your memory, mm -hmm. uh, the most interesting application you were involved in uh, when it comes to the development part or the conceptual part. Uh, I mean, the yeah, the the automation engine and the application yeah. engine comes from actually your creativity level and uh, what can you do with it so yeah probably you 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 were involved in some project in some application build that's aren't out of the box or you will you wouldn't even think of that and I think, yeah sure interacting with a lot of clients you know you kind of see the the creativity that's um uh, shown by the by by people, business departments, you know, they because they are the ones who mostly come with the ideas for improvements, you know, and uh, sometimes it's uh, company wide improvements, sometimes it's improvements uh, uh, specific to their uh, to their um, uh, departments or or teams. Uh, so one of the recent examples is um, I've been involved in discussing setting up a whole uh, center of excellence for citizen development for uh, fi a large financial institution. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the first wave, let's say, of processes that they wanted to handle were processes related to financial instruments and, uh, you know, offerings that handling of those instruments, versioning, um, managing the, the flow of uh, putting new instruments and new options out, you know, 
uh, available for their clients and so on. So everything around managing those those types of um, instruments like, uh, you know, loans, investment options and so on and so on. Uh, so that was quite interesting. And uh, the, the goal here is to achieve a lot of that using exactly this kind of approach by using low code. Um, another example was, for example, for for a, for a law firm, mm -hmm. um, there was a request to have an application that would replace the traditional Outlook and actually the project exactly what we've been yeah. talking about earlier. Yeah. So uh, a simple ticketing tool, but using custom types of tickets related to the specific processes that this this company operates and uh, the design of the application involved utilizing a lot of the low-code concepts from service now from the flows to decision tables uh, that kind of allow you to, to, to extract uh, business decisions from your from your logic, you know, mm -hmm. and, and manage them separately. Um, so there, there's also, uh, you know, on the front end side, uh, there is the whole uh, workspace ac aspect of service now, the new UI that allows you to build really compelling and really complex if needed front ends from multiple building blocks mm -hmm. and just combine them together. Um, so yeah, we're, I, I basically, I would say that, uh, for majority of the recent projects, the, the tendency is to try and utilize as much of the low code components as possible. Mm -hmm. And of course, not always can an application be fully achieved by leveraging low code. But as I mentioned, service now is the, yeah, maybe a unique platform in a way that allows you to seamlessly combine low and pro code, uh, development within one app. And it's happening in the same almost the same tool set on the same platform, you know? So that, that works seamlessly together and can later be promoted to QA, QA and, uh, and production. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of creativity out there. And, you know, also a lot of people that, that I talk to, a lot of clients, they kind of support that notion saying, yeah, we have so much, so much ideas, so much work to do. Mm -hmm. But it's just, you know, our IT is constantly busy with uh, stuff like, you know, upgrades like yeah. major projects like uh, keeping the platform up and running and healthy and so on and so on they're they're having a hard time to you know kind of push through with their ideas mm -hmm. and that's exactly what this is about just empowering the the people or in the business to start you know uh, taking uh this opportunity in their own hands i'd say yeah okay so actually you've been participating uh in the applications that uh, that actually migrated the legacy workflows into the platform itself, and I believe this is uh, this is where it started, and uh, this is where where I believe uh, uh, that companies should think about what workflows can be implemented into the platform itself, and and actually App Engine is uh, is almost in every licensing model, so uh, you can actually start with. With some you know, with some uh, small amount of tables and then get creative with it and then maybe think of uh, think of the maybe migration yeah. automation engine so. absolutely what you said I mean uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details in terms of how licensing is set up yeah. because that's of course um, something for the for the sales folks <laughs> but um, yeah I think like you said. Um, the service now uh, allows everybody to get a taste of you know what they can achieve uh, building custom apps or also enhancing out of the box processes using uh, both pro or low code um, approach and they have this dedicated offering that um, you know it's it's a kind of a strategic decision I guess mm -hmm. uh, that you know if you're if, if if you feel that your company has a lot of you know, creative potential that just sits there and use at the moment, it might be the right decision to make. You know, it, it, it seems to some people like it's it's a big upfront investment, but it's not really it's not really that. Again, you know, just talk to your salespeople about it. But um it's uh the the, the key to success in my opinion is to start small. Mm -hmm. So don't don't try to like implement full blown citizen development program across the company. Focus on one, two uh, key use cases that maybe simple ones, you know, that you know uh, you can successfully deliver. And once you have that done, um, you know, share the success, uh, kind of communicate yeah. to the rest of the company how how well that has gone. You know, what kind of benefit that that provided for those departments. And you will see quite quite soon 
that there will be natural champions that emerge from this, people who want to drive this forward. Mm -hmm. And you will have built a, uh, I would say, a network of uh, low-code evangelists and, and champions, you know, that can pretty much handle uh, low-code operations in their areas. Right. And then you can focus maybe on the more central governance, you know, and, and, and managing the incate as we, as we discussed and so on. So it's, it's, of course, not something that can be done uh, within one day. It's a, it's a process as anything else, as maybe even more so. Um, start with start small. Start with a few simple cases again, and uh, you know, uh, establish your preferred way of working. You know, again, service now gives you the tools, the trainings, the the, the capabilities you need. But um, there is one more important aspect that uh, the the platform will not handle for you, mm -hmm. uh, and that is the commitment of people to this, especially commitment of you know uh, management. Um, so those people need to be on board uh, when starting such initiatives as well, uh, because you will you will need to dedicate a little bit of um, of um, let's say uh, of capabilities, a, li a little bit of FTEs, so to say, to the um, governance part. You know, mm -hmm. people who will be reviewing the applications and so on, and working closely with business, and, and again. It's more guidance is needed at the beginning of that process, but as they become more mature and so on, you will just, you know, holding their hand less and less. Yeah, so uh, as with every implementation, I believe, uh, and as great that uh, ServiceNow uh, offers you the tools that you can govern your instance, yeah. that uh, you all have too many applications within your uh, within your platform, actually. So, so that's great that... Uh, so as far as I'm, uh, I, I understand you. You're saying that um, this is a process of uh, maturing your company in terms of building applications and changing your your company, your organization itself into into the uh, into the automation engine. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, it sounds like okay. A lot of companies can think, ah, oh, this just will never happen with us because we don't have that kind of maturity. Mm -hmm. It's um, every company is, I think, ready and, and should be ready for this because if you if you don't do it, simply that's the way that that's where the market is going. That's where you know uh, this trend is going to become more and more pronounced. And if you fall too far behind the you know, behind, behind the competition, so to say, or behind the rest of the market, you'll find yourself in a bad place in, like, in a couple of years. So I don't really think companies should like um, hesitate too much, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if to go with this or not, because this is definitely the, the way to go, at least for, for a lot of those lower complexity ads that you may, may want to build. And for a lot of your uh, departments, this is the way to make sure they stay on top of the game, so to say. Um but yes, it, 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 it cannot be done uh, in a rushed way. Uh, there needs to be a, a certain backing of, of uh, company stakeholders for that type of initiative. And uh, absolutely, um, uh, here is again where you can find professionals that will guide you on, on that journey, of course. Uh, there's companies that specialize uh, in you know helping to establish those centers of excellence, um, uh, guiding you along the path, at least at the beginning. So, you know, just reach out to your preferred um, consultants mm -hmm. and uh, they might be able to help you with this, of course. And it's uh, it's great that you mentioned uh, the name of the citizen developer uh, because uh, while I was researching and preparing myself for this episode, mm -hmm. I have stumbled upon this name, which actually doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> and uh, when I yeah. w when I hear the citizen developer, I wouldn't imagine anything related to the application build process. Uh, so yeah, and uh, and also if you could just explain to us the what's what's behind that name, and <laughs> is it like I want to become a citizen developer, so I should search it on LinkedIn where. Uh, yeah. where I can be in the throw out what stands behind yeah the, um, name I, I really I don't think uh, first of all I'm not a huge fan of that term mm -hmm. citizen developer because that still kind of suggests that you have to be a developer you have to have an IT background to, to start you know mm -hmm. doing those things uh, I don't think this is what it's about so yeah it is a term that's widely used today by the by the community by in the IT industry 
Um, again, um, maybe that's a little uh, misleading to some people. I think that the term implementer would be uh, maybe better fitting uh, because um, it's it's kind of a broad term, right? It's just basically somebody who doesn't have IT professional background who is um, participating mm -hmm. in creating new functionalities, in developing new processes or new applications that support um, the the, yeah, the workings of of your company, and uh, I think that term can encompass people with very low technical background, and those will be most likely no code uh, implementers, as I would put it. And you will have people who are a little bit more tech savvy, you know, some kind of power users, mm -hmm. people who have worked with SQL, maybe with databases a little bit. Uh, done some macros in Excel and so on, so they are a little bit more inclined to to tackle on the more techy part. So they will be doing uh, low code. Maybe even so on some occasions they are able to you know churn out one or two scripts if needed. And then you will have um, people that sometimes are referred to as a business developer. So these these are already a little bit more experienced people who typically they, they, they don't support an entire organization in terms of uh, they, they may be not part of the uh, overall IT department, but they, they stay close to the business yeah. and they can help the business a lot developing their functionalities. And those people are a, a little bit more tech savvy. So again, a citizen developer is not really a, 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 a role. It's not a, it's not a job. It's not a specific position. It is, let's say, it is, uh, I would put it as, it's not a role and a position in itself, but it's a, it's a role that you can take on within your organization. Okay. So your actual role can be business analyst, or you can be, you know, a big data analyst or anything else. You can be working in a financial department, but as a part-time, for example, because you don't also have to participate in this uh, full-time. So as a part-time, um, you, you, you can be involved in developing and um, improving the yeah, processes of your department. So again, the citizen development, I wouldn't see it as a specific role. And uh, I'm not sure if you will find, let's say, um, job offers mentioning specifically that kind of position. Because I think the, the, the point of that is that those people emerge from within the company typically, right? Mm -hmm. That's the whole thing. Um, if, if there would be specific roles, citizen developer roles, we would just be repeating the, the whole issue we have with the, I guess, with the, with the pro code developers we have today, that there isn't enough of them. Maybe here it's a little bit easier mm -hmm. and maybe you will see people who kind of tend to do that thing full time, especially given the AI that, you know, AI and the, and the, and the local tools, they, they empower you more and more. And, uh, with time, maybe we will see the majority of applications being handled that way, in which case it is maybe possible that there will be like full-time um, citizen developers, um, you know, uh, helping across multiple companies. Uh, you know, that's the general tendency. But but today I think it's mostly like people that emerge from within, uh, at least um, at this point. Okay, so you, you take from your organization very committed and very uh, active and creative people who are willing to, to do some changes around some yeah. workflows uh, and, uh, and coach them around application development. Exactly. And they become citizen developers. Exactly, of course. Yeah, like you said, you need to coach them, you need to give them some basic training so they know how to navigate around the, the part of the platform they haven't touched before. Because mm -hmm. before they were just the, the end users of the platform. Now you want them to have access to, you know, a backbone. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to give them a little bit of training, of course, set them on the right path and then kind of guide them along the way. Mm -hmm. But you empower them more and more. And again, with time, you will see that there will be natural uh, born leaders, champions, third departments that will be able to evangelize other people. So it's like uh, spreads mm -hmm. like... Uh, <laughs> Like uh, like a, I don't know wave or yeah. good news. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So thank you for that. Now I understand uh, what's behind uh, the role of uh, city visual developer. And also, I would like to. Uh, this will be la the the last question of the of the topic to the, uh, of this topic. But uh, if you could maybe provide us with some 
tips or um, some guidance how to be prepared uh, for that digital transformation in my organization. Because uh, imagine I'm a CEO of a huge company, for example, mm-hmm. a logistics, a law company, something less, uh, something led, uh, and I would like to keep up with the market, uh, with the digital transformation. I'll also see a very good value in automation engine and the application engine. And it's the start of my journey and I want to be fully prepared and I want to know what to do actually. And how can I be, how can I maybe process that or how can I plan that in the, in the future? Yeah. So that wouldn't be a disaster. That's a good question. (laughs) And, uh, I guess there's no single simple answer to that, right? I mean, it all depends, but in my opinion, before you start looking for a solution, you have to know your problem. So first of all, you have to be able to admit that there is some problem. There is some, there is something that needs changing, right? Either you have, like we said, a, a big technologies pro shadow IT going on, a little legacy process and applications, mm-hmm. or you've got your uh, business departments kind of lagging behind and, you know, not being too innovative and kind of, if you feel that there is a lot of potential just sitting and waiting around in your company, that's a high time to start acting in the in the direction of, of providing the people, you know, the right tool set. So being aware of that is one thing. So as a CEO or higher level manager, uh, I have never been, of course, <laughs> in a position like that, but my advice for, for those folks would be just listen to what's happening in your company and be open for, you know, don't, don't, don't push those kind of changes for unforeseeable future because a lot of companies struggle with the fallacy of being like a speeding train. We cannot stop. We cannot do transformation because we are constant. There's so many projects going on with and so much to do, you know, no, find, find the time and the means to do that. That's the first thing, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, make sure to uh, kind of collect some initial feedback. Uh, have some idea about what types of applications require handling or building, you know, what kind of processes are the most struggling, which which departments are uh, kind of raising the the, the biggest uh, initiatives for, for change. Is it HR? Is it um, customer service? Is it finance? You know, is it security and, and so on and so on. So be aware of where that might start. Have, have good candidates and have you know, a, a vision, again, a small vision at first, maybe it's a strategic decision for sure, but start small with maybe one department that has some nice initiatives. And then, of course, decide on the right uh, platform to handle this, on the right tool set. So do your market research and check, you know, which platforms uh, are most likely to put you in a good place in a couple of years' time, mm-hmm. not just today, but in a couple of years, you know. What is, uh, what is, you know, innovative? Uh, what kind of new trends are emerging? Again, AI, very hot topic. Yeah. We don't have time to discuss it today, maybe, but it goes hand in hand with this low code approach. Uh, for example, in service now, starting from the Vancouver version with Lattice Generative AI offering, it's yeah. a collaboration between service now and NVIDIA. So strongest player in the AI market, if you ask me, at least from the infrastructure perspective. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, and there's a lot of companies investing in those areas, you know. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out on features like that because this is something that will allow you to uh, be up to date, you know, mm-hmm. and not fall behind the, the competition or the rest of the market. Um, so, yeah, take this into consideration. And, um, yeah, make sure you find the good, uh, good help. For the you know at least for the beginning of your journey, make sure you find a, a partner that you trust that can guide you along uh, along this process. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much the, the the important things to think about to to start to, to begin with. Okay, don't forget about governance and yeah. you know having somebody in your company as well that will keep an eye on <laughs> which direction this is going to you know just uh, prevent. Uh, everybody running wild with their uh, idea and then creating that coral reef <laughs> that I mentioned before as well. Yeah, okay. So, wow. Uh, thank you for explaining to us the, the low-code or no-code approach. 
uh, methodology, I would say, uh, to the to me and to our listeners out there. Uh, I believe it is not uh, the 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 topic is not covered fully. Oh, uh, there's there are a lot of topics, so I believe you you will join us in uh, in the next episode. Uh, I'm looking forward to to it. And before we say goodbye to our service help pilots out there, I would like to ask you one last question. That sure. uh, this is the question that I ask uh, to all of my guests because this is a simple question, but from each and every of you, my guess, has okay. different experience. Uh, when you say a simple question, the uh, issues you not have four, they were like, you know, seems simple that <laughs> I talk about them for, for days. <laughs> I think, yeah, that surprised me. Uh, yeah, so what do you like the most about service dot platform? Because uh, I believe this is a, in the question that each and every of my guests will give different answers. See, I knew it. Uh, another simple question. We could talk about this again for for hours. What do I like about service now? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh man, where do I start? Um, you know, eight years is kind of a, a, a long time, and uh, I guess one of the things I like most about service now is how they evolve. How they don't stay dormant. They are always kind of ahead of the game, in my opinion, investing in the latest features and latest technologies. And all of that is part of one platform. So as someone who's uh, technical like me, I'm an architect or technical consultant, if you will, depending on the specific project maybe. Mm -hmm. But I know there is like one platform that provides me with pretty much the complete tool set mm -hmm. to achieve whatever I need. And this is, this is great because I don't have to uh, invest time and effort into researching a lot of different technologies and so on. I can achieve like 90% of my goals with, with the things that Service now offers. And, you know, uh, you, you just see how they expand and how they um, invest in uh, not only the technology, but they invest in industry solutions. This is also quite important. So they have ready solutions for telecom. They have ready solutions for uh, a lot of other, you know, industries. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is what I like about the platform. That's for sure. Um, what I also like about service now is how fast I am able to see the results of my work, you know, and that applies, of course, especially to low code, but even I work on a lot of complex pro code applications too, a lot of complex processes. Mm -hmm. And even then, uh, it's just amazing how easy it is to create a new form or a new portal, you know, combine uh, APIs together, prepare a couple tables in the database and see that come to life, you know, it's, uh, it can be dealt with in a matter of days using this platform. So it's just amazing how fast that uh, development and iteration loop can be. Mm -hmm. So you have your prototype ready, you consult that with your client, you do some small tweaks here and there, and then you have the final product. And I think that's just, uh, that's something I really like about this platform. That's great. That's great. So... Yeah. There's a lot of other things probably. That I like save it for the next episode. Things maybe I not I don't enjoy so much. It's it will come on everywhere. But I think yeah, it's um the 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 huge strength is the versatility, flexibility, keeping up, you know, with the latest technology and giving you that whole tool set in one place. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there is another platform to be honest that merges low code and pro code capabilities so well in into one uh tool set into one platform and i think that's really great and that's what uh customers of service now appreciate a lot as well okay yeah uh, i think uh almost the same uh, about this uh, about this platform but i always want to want to hear what uh what my guests and uh are, are saying about this uh simple but not very simple uh question uh, and yeah, thank you for sharing with us your experience, your your knowledge about the application uh, process. Um, and uh, to our listeners, to our service now pilots, if you have any questions related to service now platform, of course, but related to uh, applications, App Engine, and all the topics related to that, please don't hesitate to leave the comment below and reach out to us via any social media that we have. We have TikTok, we have, we have Instagram, and we are willing to, to take those questions uh, to this table and answer them. So Absolutely. 
Yeah, oh, yeah, I would say, yeah, don't be shy, people. If you have any sort of uh, business or technical kinds of questions, just throw them at us. We'll do our uh, best to, uh, you know, to answer them for you, to help you along the way. Um, again, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg here because you can talk for probably many days about oh, App yeah. Engine and the automation engine that I think you mentioned at some point. Mm-hmm. It's another kind of solution that goes hand in hand with, with App Engine. Uh, technically, it's uh, both of them are used for developing low code and the f- uh, functionalities and automations in the process. So, if you have any questions around that part, just you know, don't hesitate to let us know. Exactly Good for you. Exactly. So, stay tuned and see you in the next episode. Yeah. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks.